been going back and forth with the recent experiment at CERN regarding the decay of beauty masons and the measurement of an anomalous magnetic moment at Fermilab is something to get hyped about. I'm still not sure, but before we get into wishful thinking, let's talk about the angle of momentum. <laughs> so, whenever you have a mass, M, where some velocity, V, with respect to some origin, and let's call the position vector R, then angular momentum is just the component perpendicular to position vector. Now, convention uses L for angular momentum, but for reasons, mostly aesthetics, we're going to go for uppercase lambda. So, angular momentum is then the position crossed with its linear momentum. Now this is all fine for point particles, but what about my wheel? Clearly there's just a bunch of stuff and it's going about some common centre, but what's its angular momentum? Well, just split the angular momentum into infinitesimal volume elements of some density. So we have so the change in the mass for some volume element will just be the density. So this is equal to the density at the position R. Integrating back over the volume, we would then get that the angular momentum And we see that the angular momentum is just the integral over the volume uh, of the position vector crossed with the velocity vector uh, scaled by the density at the position R. And you do this over every volume element. Now, why we have written it this way uh, will become clear later on. Uh, but first, some ch 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 changes with respect to find how torque rocks the roller but seriously torque is just the change in angular momentum with respect to time now we can write this out and we get now if we just expand this thing And for those who remember, change in velocity with respect to time, well that's just acceleration. Change in position with respect to time, well that's just velocity. But now we have velocity crossed with itself, so this whole thing just becomes zero. And for those who remember even better, this is just the position vector crossed with force. And now we finally have the tools needed to understand the curious phenomenon known as precession. So what's going on? Well, initially, the wheel had some angular momentum. Upon release, the force of gravity induces a torque around the pivot, causing the wheel to deflect from its initial axis by the angle theta. So now the change in angular momentum is just the angular momentum sine of theta. Now let's have a look at some test points before and after and the velocity component. Notice how the horizontal component doesn't change as we deflect downwards, but the vertical component, there's a definite change with respect to the direction of force. 
but in order to have a change in the momentum we need some force and to counteract this force the whole wheel needs to shift over but now as the wheel reacted there's a definite change to the horizontal component so a uh, perpendicular reaction will push the wheel back up um, but now it's fighting with gravity so it ends up just processing around and we can find a rate of precession let's call it phi we know that this change in phi well it must be so now the change in angular momentum well we already know this as and since this is just the change in angular momentum we need change in angular momentum with respect to time we we'll mul multiply out the dt and we see that we have sine theta, sine theta we just cancel and we have that the change in the asymmetrical angle is this thing and um, if we just divide out the dt we have the rate of precession um, And we haven't talked about it, but we could write this in terms of the moment of inertia and the rotation rate of the wheel. Now, so far, we've pretty much assumed that this was acceleration due to gravitational field, but it doesn't have to be. So we're going to extend this picture into a magnetic field. So let's say we have some charges and they're moving in a circle and all of this is bounded by some volume V. Now since moving charges it's just a current. We should have something similar going on. Um, but instead of integrating over the mass density, we should in be integrating over the current density at some position R. So the magnetic moment. It's just the integral over the volume V for the position vector crossed by the velocity vector scaled by the current density at the position of the volume elements V. Usually people will either use M or Mu um, for the magnetic moment um, for reasons that will become obvious. Uh, those are ill-advised. Instead, uppercase M, but you sort of try to make it look like a double lambda for conceptual symmetry. And yeah, if you haven't seen it already, this is pretty much identical to the angular momentum. And if we just consider the fact that both the current density and the mass density both derive their um, quantities from the same number of particles. Um, we can do some rearranging and we will get, end up with the where Q is the charge of the particle, M is the mass, and down to about the size of an electron orbiting the nucleus, this relationship does hold, but 
if you were to look at something like the intrinsic angle of momentum of an electron, you need to nudge this a bit. Now this nudge is known as the G factor for an electron in orbit around the nucleus. The gyromagnetic ratio, or G factor, would simply be one or thereabouts. Um, whereas if we were to look at the intrinsic angle of momentum or the spin of an electron in the magnetic field, we need to go a bit deeper. Now, you may consult the Dirac equation and eventually you will find that electrons tend to do this thing where you go 360 degrees but you're not in the same configuration and continuing rotating we do another 360 degrees and we're back in the same configuration so it's a spin half particle thus if we had say an electron or in our case a muon came in scattered off some photon spun around twice and went back out we may then assume that the muon g factor would be equal to 2 and it's all neat and satisfactory and we can rest easily but then you wake up next morning exhibit staring you in the face saying my boy famine and swing and just use quantum electrodynamics to put some interactions on your interactions and you go oh fuck so you know that the projection of the initial state um, to the final state will be given in terms of the S matrix and a way to approximate the S matrix would be something like a Dyson series so And yeah, this is not supposed to be a lecture on quantum and liquid dynamics. Um, but I want to show the Dyson series. And just so we have some insight. So this thing will give you the scattering amplitude for some interaction V. And the T in the brackets is just symbolizing put these in chronological order um, T is time H naught free part or the time invariant part of the Hamiltonian um, but I'm sort of diverging from the point I want to make and um, so it's this series uh, those of you familiar with Taylor polynomials may assume that because of this n factorial this series eventually converges but in this case, the product and the integral puts up such a fight that eventually this thing will diverge. But it's also an example of something known as an asymptotic series. Uh, and that just, if we just truncate it or just stop for some end, we will get an approximation of the function we, well, try to, are trying to find. Uh, in our case, the S matrix. This works in quantum electrodynamics because the coupling constant uh, or this interaction string uh, is given in terms of the fine structure constant. Now, since this is way less than one, essentially as you pile up interactions, they contribute less and less. So now, if you use quantum electrodynamics to calculate the muon g factor, you get something like where we have the 
contribution from first order and higher order uh, quantum electrodynamical corrections. But so far we've only talked about quantum electrodynamics. Uh, eventually, where the strong and weak interaction should come into play. Now, the weak force being weak, plays nice. This is not, however, the case for the strong force, having a coupling constant close to or equal to 1. Um, so, perturbation techniques like the S matrix no longer holds. Uh, it is the case that for higher energy, something known as asymptotic freedom kicks in, and you can use perturbation techniques in quantum chronodynamics. But for lower energies, you will actually have to use some experimental data. Let's take the contribution from the hadronic vacuum polarization uh, to the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Now, ignoring almost everything, we see that the contribution to the anomalous magnetic moment uh, from the hadronic vacuum polarization uh, will be given by this thing, uh, where we have some integral from uh, this E0 to the cutoff where asymptotic freedom kicks in. This k hat is a kernel function, some number between 0 and 1, just think of it as 1 for now. Uh, the thing we care about is this R ratio, and um, that's the cross section. So this R ratio is the probability that an electron-positron collision would result in hadrons uh, with respect to the energy scale. Now for this part, we have the certain topic freedom thing, so we can use perturbation techniques similar to the Dyson series uh, to calculate this probability. I'm oversimplifying a bit, but for lower energy scales, we actually do have to do the experiment. We need to smash a bunch of particles, electrons and positrons together, and look at the probability that these would result in hadronic particles like quarks. The main point to take from this is that we don't actually have a fundamentally theoretical calculation of the R ratio. Uh, we actually have to smash uh, electrons positrons together at various energy scales in order to uh, extrapolate this R ratio. So now to bring it all home, um, I mentioned the weak force. You can use similar techniques as Dyson series um, and if you take it all together the folks that actually bother doing the calculation the number they got where well, this would mostly be the hadronic part and this is the contribution from the weak interaction Now these are sort of just placeholder diagrams for the strong and weak interaction, but this is the final theoretical result. But how would you go about measuring this in real life? Well, first you need a bunch of muons, and you need a giant magnet to hold said muons. Now. Inside of the magnetic field, this muon will have orbital angular momentum and it will have spin angular momentum. Now, eventually, the muon decays, resulting in a positron, since we're using anti muons, and because of the magnetic field and the light mass of the electron. Uh, it will spiral inwards, where eventually will hit the straw chamber. Now the straw chamber is just a bunch of Geiger tubes that you have stacked together like this. And as an 
incoming particle uh, ionizes the gas, you pick up the signal and you can far extrapolate or triangulate the path that the particle took through your straw chamber. After going through the straw chamber, the particle hits the calorimeter, pretty similar to this one, uh, where you have some usually salt crystal that will give up photons proportional to the energy of the incoming particle and then you have a photomultiplier uh, on the back end. Uh, this one is a sodium iodine uh, scintillator but in the G-2 experiment uh, they were using lead fluoride uh, I'm guessing so that it won't suck water straight out of the air and end up like this. Regardless, a scintillator is just some material that has the property that it will give up a number of photons proportional to the energy of the incoming particle and then you just have a photomultiply photo tube in order to count the photons and extrapolate the energy of the particle uh, I drew a old school vacuum tube for the multiplier but the world has moved on to silicon uh, like avalanche diodes and stuff like that but now since we have the path and the energy we can extract the anomalous procession now if we only knew the magnetic field with high enough precision we could find a value for the anomalous magnetic moment. Oh, I should probably clarify. So when I talk about the anomalous magnetic moment, um, it's just g factor minus q divided by two. So the guys at Fermilab, they have this trolley. Um, it has a nuclear magnetic resonance probe. And um, that is calibrated um, with the equivalent proton spin. So we actually have that. So the proton spin procession will be equal to the magnetic field strength. And after plugging in and scaling, since we measure the resulting positrons, not the actual muons, the anomalous magnetic moment for the muon is given by so now we have that the anomalous ma magnetic moment um, is equal to the anomalous precession uh, over the um, Procession of the proton spin, um, which ties up to the magnetic field strength, which we measure with the N NMR. Um, then we have the scaling terms, uh, which would be the electron g factor and the mass of the electron and the electron magnetic moment. Uh, and to put it in the right scale, we also have a magnetic moment of the proton spin uh, of the N NMR. So now let's swap this back for our OGG factor it's equal to 3 so far so good uh, but that's not unexpected 3 1 oh we're still doing pretty well 8 4 hmm that's a bit weird but we may still be within the bounds of the arrow uh, we have a 1, and I need to check my notes, 2, 2, and hopefully the arrows will put this within bounds, and we have 82. Well, that's a problem. <laughs>
And this is the discrepancy everyone has been raging about. As we can see, there's a small discrepancy. Um, and not unsurprisingly, it is within the Hadron uh, region. Now, I should mention, there's another way you could do the theoretical calculation. And that's just having a computer do quantum chronodynamics on smaller and smaller scales. Uh, uh, known as lattice computation. Now you need a pretty hefty computer to play around with it and I'm not familiar with it. Uh, still I'm gonna write the result uh, but I'm not stepping too far out of my comfort zone. Uh, but the guys that did um, well, I should say there's several, been several that's gotten similar results considering the error terms um, these two do technically overlap so yeah this may be a better calculation but we don't un really understand why it would be a better calculation um, so we're still at the stop and all the other laps come computations have gotten similar results in the past uh, but some also haven't and I'm not really comfortable saying to what extent you, extent you can cherry pick your results in this, these kinds of computations now I could have ended the video here but there may be some hints coming from another experiment uh, at LHCB where they look at the decay of the beauty mason or the bottom mason or whatever you want to call it it's an up quark and an anti-bottom quark um, and this will decay into uh, uh, KL up in the anti strange uh, charge W U boson. Oh, yeah, I can probably do this. So, this charge, charge, but also what happened was through the said boson, we end up with. We end up with an anti-muon and a muon or equally possible at least if we consider lepton flavor universality a fact a positron and an electron so yeah the probability of a cross section for positively charged beauty mason into a k on and a new anti muon divided by cross section of the probability of a beauty mason decaying into k on Given lepton flavor universality, this thing should be one. But the guys at LHCB got the result with some error in the last digit that I can't remember. Now, if it turns out that this is the case, currently at 3.5 sigma confidence level. We may have a violation of lepton flavor universality. That is, the C boson is acting a bit weird and prefer to decay into electron versus muons. Uh, the other possibility uh, is that 
we have a case of a flavour changing neutral colourant. So a muon goes in and an electron comes out and this was shedded through some particle. This particle may just be said boson. Um, but there are some other possibilities, especially in supersymmetry. Um, folks shutting quantum gravity, probably full of it, but I'd love to be proven incorrect. Uh, it could be a pretty cool dark matter candidate. Uh, since, well, if you consider some early universe was populated by tau and muons, uh, and through some neutral discharge, you were left with these particles. Uh, then, in that case, they could not be uh, an ordinary said boson because it would sort of imply that it's stable. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's pretty interesting. So there's a bunch of experiments left to do. Uh, First off, just repeating those already done to boost the confidence level. Uh, also, it would be interesting looking at how the R ratio would turn out if you were to collide muons and anions instead of electron positrons. Mm, but you run into some difficulties of producing muons and anions, capturing them in their own separate trap and then colliding them afterwards challenging, not impossible. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the continued results of uh, the folks at Fermilab and LHCB and hopefully they find something interesting. <laughs>